Between 1914 and 1918, the world was torn apart by four years of war. Mighty empires that had existed for centuries fell almost overnight, leaving a chaotic landscape of new nation states in their wake. Yet the turmoil didn't just end after the First World War. These states, both the victors and the losers, were faced with a brand new challenge, to find a way to prevent such a conflict from ever happening again. This issue was so pressing that US President Woodrow Wilson stated in his 14 points to Congress in January 1918 that a general association of nations would be formed after the war. This association would be used to create a platform for international mediation, defend the territorial integrity of all nations and respect the self-determination of ethnic groups. Never before had an organisation like the League of Nations commanded such immense influence in the international arena, in an era when great power politics had once been the norm just decades prior. Yet the League would be officially dissolved in 1946, just 26 years after its inception, and arguably became defunct following the Western policy of appeasement toward the fascist powers in the 1930s. But why was this the case? Why did the League of Nations fail and above all, was it doomed to failure from the beginning? In this video, we'll be taking a look at a brief history of the League of Nations, from its creation to its ultimate downfall, and whether this was predetermined from the start. On its most fundamental level, the League of Nations was designed to facilitate universal disarmament, ensure the mediation of future conflicts, and guide what was seen as lesser countries to civilization. Above all, the League was to put an end to the great power politics which had dominated European affairs since the Peace of Westphalia at the end of the Thirty Years' War. The same force that had brought Europe's empires to rise and ruin would never again be the mode of international diplomacy. The immediate post-war concern for the victorious Entente powers was the elimination of their enemy's military strength. These limitations would be imposed through the various post-war treaties, which they hoped would be enforced under the League. Hungary, for example, not only stripped of two-thirds of its land, would be limited to just 35,000 men as dictated by the Treaty of Trianon. Bulgaria would also be limited to 20,000 under the Treaty of Neuilly, and most famous of all, Germany would only be allowed 100,000 men under the Treaty of Versailles. Whilst the League itself couldn't directly exert power in aiding this process, it did improve mutual cooperation by creating annual reports on the national weapon stockpiles of many nations. It also forged treaties banning the use of chemical weapons and encouraged non-alignment agreements. Except that's where the power of the League ended, as it wielded no actual ability to enforce these treaties, and many that were signed were then simply ignored, which would be a common occurrence throughout its short history. When it came to international mediation and diplomacy, the League was slightly more successful. On paper, all members of the League were equal, with recognised territory and status. Many of these members were surprisingly not located in Europe, because other continents do in fact exist. For example, China, Japan and Ethiopia were amongst the most prominent members of the League. International disputes throughout the 1920s were often mediated or put through to the League. This was done during the 1921 Arland Island dispute between Finland and Sweden, with Finland ultimately being given the islands in exchange for autonomy for its Swedish population. The use of war itself to resolve disputes was renounced through the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1926, which was signed under the oversight of the League. But it's important to note that this treaty functioned independently from the League, and would continue even after it was replaced by the United Nations. In any case, as the world slowly lurched into the 1930s, disputes, mainly territorial and ideological, became far more common as the entire political climate was increasingly polarised. Nowhere was this more apparent than the 1931 Manchuria Crisis, which was widely seen as the first death blow to the League, as it failed to prevent the Japanese invasion of Manchuria and the creation of the puppet state of Manchukuo. Neither was much done when Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1935, apart from a few trade embargoes that had minimal impact on the course of the war. Often seen as a precursor, or even a part of the Second World War, the Spanish Civil War was the final battleground where the League of Nations may have been able to hinder its downfall. Fighting between Franco's fascists and the Republican forces had been ongoing since 1936, with the League largely taking a back seat. Efforts were made to limit the interference of foreign arms and volunteers through a non-intervention pact. On paper, Germany, Italy and the Soviet Union were signatories, but still sent weapons, advisers and even soldiers which further weakened the League's international standing. By 1938, it was clear that the main backers of the League would do whatever possible to delay war, and adopted a rigid stance of appeasement that allowed Austria and Czechoslovakia to be wiped from the map. In this regard, the League's main downfall was due to a combination of apathy from its main democratic backers in the West, and its lack of executive power. In hindsight, it seems obvious that the League was doomed from the beginning. After all, 
It lacked a clear organizational structure, it lacked the backing of the United States and couldn't resist the will of fascism as it swept across Europe. Yet as always, the answer isn't so simple. Even in 1932, when the League had begun to falter, Edvard Benes, the future Prime Minister of Czechoslovakia, stated that the cooperation that the League enabled was radically different than what had preceded the First World War. When the League was formed in 1920, the geopolitical environment was radically different than what it would be in 1936. Fascism was still in its infancy, and it seemed a democracy had become the new norm. Simply put, the League wasn't designed to work in a system dominated by fascist states, who regarded equal international cooperation to be untenable. Whether the League was successful deserves a whole video on its own, but the belief that the League was always destined to fall apart is slowly changing as new evidence comes to light. Whatever would come to pass, the League of Nations laid the groundwork for many of the organs that would make up the future United Nations, and provided a valuable first attempt at globalised diplomacy, something which had never been seen before. Thanks for watching if you made it this far. Please do like, comment, subscribe, all the usual stuff if you want to see more, as it really, really does help the channel. I'm Irovic and I'll see you in the next one.